Secretary Podesta, Secretary of Business, Consumer Services, and Housing Agency. Good afternoon, Yana Olson Morgan here for Mike Wilkening, Secretary of California Health and Human Services Agency. And now we can really get started because uh, <laughs> on my uh, right, <clears throat> Karen Ross, Secretary of Food and Agriculture. Okay, well, uh, thank you. As I said, um, uh, I'll be sitting in as the uh, chair today, which explains why it took us a second to figure out how to call the meeting to order. Um, <clears throat> um, and let me note uh, just uh, an update on the agenda. Uh, item 7 has been taken off the agenda, as has uh, item uh, 8. Uh, no, item 9, the reinvestment of reimbursed Proposition 84 funds. Um, uh, and you're anticipating, at least with regard to uh, item nine, that that would come back at the October meeting? Is that the... Yes, we're just going to continue to refine uh, with some new information from the Department of Conservation. We're going to refine that and bring it back to the council in October. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so those are the changes to the uh, agenda. Uh, but anybody who had any questions about either of those things, could, uh, either of those madams, our matters can bring it up in the general public comment section at the end. Is that correct, uh, Louise? That's what I, the way we're proposing to go with that? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, having said that, uh, then the first item on the uh, agenda that requires our time is the approval of the uh, minutes. Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a, a, a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I think that you won't be voting because of, uh, because you weren't you didn't have the privilege and honor to be at that last <laughs> meeting. So uh, okay, all those who are qualified then to vote, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, so that passes, unanim that passes unanimously. Uh, I will say that the other one of the other boards I chair is the Board of Directors for the Western Climate Initiative, which has Quebec as a member. And we all say, you can say I or we. So I almost did that for that last uh, matter. <laughs> Maybe we should add that in to add an international flair. So interesting. Yeah, quick question, yes. Um, if I should be on speaker, this is a procedural question, but should I be on record as abstaining versus part of the unit? I just don't, I. Yeah, I'll have you as an abstention. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, 
So the next item up on the agenda is uh, council member updates. So I don't know if members of the council have any updates that they would like to share. I'm never going to miss a chance to talk about cow waste or soils. <laughs> Um, just before the Global Climate Action Summit, we released um, additional funding for alternative manure management grants. Um, those have been very popular, and it was um, a little over $19 million um, for those grants, and they tie in very nicely to the Global Soil Health Challenge that was announced at the summit in San Francisco. Um, and there's a lot of excitement around the, the possibilities of land and soils to sequester carbon. It was really underscored at the, at the summit. Um, CDFA hosted two days prior to that that was all around climate smart agriculture and healthy soils. Julia, it's really great to have you there. I think you'll agree it was great discussions on the first day. And then we did tours for people to meet with landowners and really connect what the, we'd been talking about the first day to practices on the ground. Um, we already have some new folks who have signed up to do a carbon farm plan, um, which is a pretty cool way of really getting this integrated resource approach on, on farms. Um, and the Vice President for Sustainability from the UK offices of McDonald's said it was refreshing to go to a summit where soils and land and healthy soils and carbon on agricultural lands was not even mentioned two years ago and then it was everywhere um, during that week of events. And so it, I think California, again, by having a natural and working landscape strategy as part of our climate action plan has really shown people what's possible. And I just want to thank all of the staff who have been working on all of this and to see that come forward in such a positive way was really heartening. Mm -hmm. So I just, I had to brag a little bit. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you did. Uh, any other members of the uh, council who have uh, updates you want to give us? Certainly. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for your warm welcome. And I just want to tell the community and the audience that obviously I'm new to this position, but I am an open door and I would like people to educate me and get me up to speed on the issues that you're passionate about and that I'm going to try to do my best to represent the public's and community's viewpoint. Um, I have a strong background in equity and climate justice, and that's my lens and where my organization comes from. So that's how I'll be looking at a lot of decisions. Um, but most importantly, you know, I'm on a learning curve and I wanna be available and accessible. So I just wanna put that out there to everybody who's here today. Thank you. Be careful what you ask for, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> no, it's a, it's a pleasure having uh, you on the uh, council and I always appreciate having other attorneys on the council with me, so uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Are there any other comments? Oh, yes, please. Um, just, a, just a quick note about a number of homeless um, programs that are being issued through agency in our departments. Um, it's been a very active quarter. We do have three grants that are currently available with um, no, notice of fundings. We have the Homeless Emergency Aid Program. Um, the first tranche of the SB2 funding, and then also the No Place Like Home planning grants. And um, both our Homeless Coordinating Financing Council and Housing and Community Development have been very active around the state, making sure that local jurisdictions are aware of those funding dollars that are currently available. Thank you. Any other comments? Louise, I will leave it to you to describe during the executive uh, director's report, uh, you know, the summit or give a summary on the uh, summit. So uh, otherwise I would mention it myself, but I'll, I'll trust it to you, okay? Um, so that leaves us uh, with the next uh, uh, item on the uh, calendar, which is the uh, consent calendar. And I believe there are two things on the consent calendar, right, Louise? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, so we have two items on the consent calendar and I'll um, work through one and then we can take action on it and then go through the other, does that sound? Um, uh, the first item on the calendar um, has to do with a program evaluation for transformative climate communities. Um, as the council knows, we're in the process of finalizing grant agreements for uh, round one awardees in Ontario, Watts, and Fresno. 
Um, and so part of the process of uh, awarding these round one grants uh, with our work with the California Air Resources Board uh, is a requirement that we track indicators um, as a condition, of course, of receiving greenhouse gas reduction funds um, for all the individual project types like those that are included in the TCC program. Uh, ARB and the council also wanted to define additional indicators uh, to really track and the overall success of the TCC program. So really trying to get at the transformational uh, change that uh, we're trying to accomplish. So all of the round one applicants were asked to submit indicator tracking plans with their application. We then contracted with researchers from UC Berkeley and UC Los UC University of UCLA, sorry, um, who worked with all three grantees um, to select and refine the indicators that will be tracked uh, and developed a logic model for doing this evaluation. And I should say this is a logic model and an approach that will be transferable, um, not, just, not just for this round of funding, but for future rounds of TCC awardees. And so they also developed a draft evaluation plan um, for collecting required data um, and just assessing program success overall. Um, and so it the plan involves collecting data, uh, looking at the sites before and after the investment using survey data, as well as comparing the sites where we're making investment to comparable sites to be able to look at the change. Uh, so during plan development, it, um, it became clear that the grantees, we didn't have all of the information available at the time of application, um, don't have the resources available or the capacity to do all of the um, evaluation and reporting activities. So uh, based on our analysis of the funding that has been allocated in the round one of grants and some of our administrative funds, um, over the five years plus the five-year term of the grant and then two additional years required for tracking, so seven years total for each site, uh, we have an, a gap of about $1.2 million. And so we're asking the council to approve uh, use of $1.2 million from our program funds from our 1819 allocation to complete that evaluation and further uh, the finalization of the framework that we'll use going forward. Could you remind us how much we have in our 1819 allocation? $50 million. That includes the $10 million from? Yes. Oh, okay. Are there any questions on uh, consent items? So usually we would go, um, we wouldn't have any discussion on it most of the time, but uh, if there are any questions, okay. What's the, what's the, we'll, we'll take both, a, we'll take the consent calendar as a whole. And as a whole, okay. So why don't you go on to the next item as well. And I should mention that if anybody has any uh, comments that they want to make on any matter that's on the agenda, they uh, can fill out a, uh, a uh, comment card and, and give it to the folks who are, are on my right or on your left, and they will uh, get it up to me by coming up to this very high wall. <laughs> And this hand will appear, and I'll get this piece of paper. So. <clears throat> Great. Okay. So the second item. Oh, did I do that? Um, oh, it's on the same one. I can just click ahead. No, yeah. We're... Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Uh, the second item actually has is to do with the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program. Uh, and we're looking at a revision to the guidelines um, to extend the disbursement deadline in each round of for rounds one and two of the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program um, by, uh, by approximately two years. Um, and so this eliminates deadlines for standard agreement signing, um, and it will uh, expedite processes to get the agreement signed. Um, and so it extends the construction start date by two years and the construction complete date by one to two years. Um, and the reason for doing these extensions is that um, the awardees need to be able to complete their projects um, without being in breach of contract with HCD. Um, project costs have risen since these awards were made, um, and so this gives the, uh, app, the awardees time to find additional funding if it is necessary to secure that funding. And it also reduces a barrier where lenders were hesitant to make loans because these milestones and deadlines 
provisions were in the contracts. And so it removes that risk of a breach of contract that the banks were seeing as an impediment. Um, and so the amendment, the sooner we make the amendment, uh, the better for the applicants who are, sorry, the awardees who are looking to construct their projects, uh, just because as construction prices continue to rise, this challenge becomes larger. Uh, so we've been working with HCD on the language, which is up here, uh, that will be uh, the language changes that will be made and have come to agreement on around this amendment. Okay, well, thank you. I think we can all agree breach of contract is not a good thing, so uh, it's, it's good to make these uh, changes. Are there any questions from the members of the council? Okay, I have not seen anybody run up with a, a comment card, so uh, I'm assuming there are no comments on uh, this matter. Mm -hmm. Is this on the consent count? Okay, so um, Adam Cooperman? Thank you. Um, Very well hopefully done, you Reese. could hear me. I don't have to start all over. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you and we would greatly appreciate the, the passing of this resolution and the uh, further work with HCD to bring this updated milestone into our project terms. Um, that's it, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so do we have a, a motion to move the consent calendar? I'll move. Okay, we have a motion by Julie. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, second by uh, Nicole. Um, oh, okay, Lynn. she's Lynn. Thanks, sorry. I, <laughs> I thought I heard it. <laughs> my my left ear is not sorry. good enough. Um, okay, uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposition? Abstentions? Hearing none, it passes unanimously. So now we go on to the next phase of the Louise show, uh, which will be the <laughs> yeah. executive director's report. Yeah. Uh, I don't sing or dance, so just get say that. Um, so yeah, so we'll do a quick executive director's report um, and provide some updates, and then uh, Natalie will step up with a legislative update for us. Um, so I'll start just with activities and communications. First, we'd like to welcome uh, Nicole to the council. We're really looking forward to working with you. So please don't hesitate to be in touch if we can help in any way. Um, and then also SGC has added several new staff and I'm not sure if they've all been uh, introduced at a council meeting, but we have um, uh, Kevin Peth, who is our new senior administrator, uh, Douglas Bojack, who's our new staff attorney, and then Douglas Burt, who is our executive fellow, has joined us as a uh, policy analyst. So, um, so I just wanted to make to welcome them all uh, to the staff. Um, so, outreach and communications. In a short amount of time since our last meeting, there has been quite a bit of activity. Um, uh, I'll start uh, with the California Adaptation Forum, which took place at the end of August in Sacramento. Um, we had several staff participate and attend, uh, really, and that was really focused on local governments uh, and regional governments here in California taking action to respond to climate change um, and prepare for those impacts. That was an official affiliate event of then um, the small gathering we had in San Francisco um, at the Global Climate Action Summit. And um, Secretary Ross already mentioned there were hundreds of affiliate events around that, um, including several that were um, sponsored by state agencies, including the Department of Food and Agriculture's. Uh, we had an all day science to action day event that was a partnership between the Office of Planning and Research and the American Geophysical Union. Cal EPA and the University of California held a convening, uh, a full day convening on ed education and climate change. And then that led in, of course, to the summit overall, um, which was an exciting uh, couple of days of plenary sessions and um, great breakouts talking about things like healthy soils uh, and other initiatives that were underway. I think there is still work going on to gather all of the uh, commitments and everything that came out of that summit, but 
Uh, I know SGC had several staff participating, and I think all of you might have been there as well. So really, it was a fun, exciting day. A couple of days, week, I guess it was a full week. Um, so I also wanted to mention just uh, personally, I had an opportunity to go down um, last week to San Bernardino and attend a celebration event for the first award that we uh, made in San Bernardino uh, for their Arrow, phase two of a, a project they have underway there at Arrowhead Grove. And uh, for me, it was the first time I've gotten to go and see uh, an award uh, that was it has yet to be built, but um, just to see the appreciation and excitement in that community and get to talk to residents who are living there was really great. Um, and then that leads to the final item, which is um, we're actually reaching the point where we're starting to see a lot more ground, grand openings of investments made through the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Project. I think we've had four or five in the last year, um, but just recently had one in Dinuba. Um, and another down in National City, um, where we're actually getting to see places where people are starting to live and projects with walls. And so it's really exciting to see. And so several staff have been participating in those as well. Um, and so we'll continue to provide updates to you all as more of those projects are coming online. Um, so next, uh, we just want to provide an update on health and the Health and All Policies Task Force. Um, in your packets, you're, you'll find uh, an update that summarizes activities since June. Um, <clears throat> and then just a few highlights. One is that the HIAP Task Force Racial Equity Capital co Cohort continues to make progress. Um, they're finalizing 12 racial equity action plans across the participating agencies. And planning and recruitment is underway for the um, 2019 implementation year. And that year will focus on helping teams implement the action plans um, that are developed during this first year. Um, and at the November council meeting, we will provide an update on the work that the SGC team has been doing around this, um, and then a broader update on this uh, work underway. Um, and then we are also have been working, uh, high up staff have been working with the task force to gather input on priority activities for 2019. Um, and have been conducting uh, briefings with agency leads um, to assess progress on implementation activities and talk through future priorities. Um, one of the key priority areas is to lift up the work that all of the agencies are doing um, to advance health and equity through grant programs. Um, <clears throat> and then practices and tools to streamline how that work is happening across government agencies. Uh, and then we're also, uh, HIAP partners have also been asking um, for a new action plan to advance active transportation and healthy transportation um, since the last one of those expired last year. A quick update on affordable housing and sustainable communities. Uh, the staff has, <clears throat> excuse me, just put out, just completed the comment period on the round four guidelines. That deadline was yesterday. Uh, we got, I saw, I know in my inbox, many emails coming in at the last minute. So uh, we did get a lot of comments uh, on those guidelines and we'll be working through those over the coming weeks. And those guidelines will be brought to the council in um, October at our next meeting on October 29th. Um, and then a few um, reports uh, and activities I just wanted to highlight for folks. One is uh, in, uh, in August, the state finalized the fourth California climate change assessment. Um, and there's a nice summary report that is available as well as about 53 technical reports that look at climate impacts across a range of topics. Uh, I mentioned this also because alongside that work was the completion of a report coming out of the Climate Smart Infrastructure, sorry, the Climate Safe Infrastructure Working Group, which was led by the Natural Resources Agency. This was directed through Assembly Bill 2800, uh, and the, the report coming out is paying it forward the path toward climate safe infrastructure in California. Uh, this report is being presented to the legislature and also to the Strategic Growth Council uh, as we were called out in legislation. And so we will have the authors of that report presenting the findings uh, coming up in, in November was the first council meeting we were able to, to make that scheduling work. But I just wanted to put that on folks' radar screen. It really is a great report and it couples very nicely with the, the most recent science coming out of the fourth climate change assessment. 
Um, and then finally, one other uh, effort that c culminated um, uh, right prior to the summit was on the California Biodiversity Initiative. And this was a, a collaborative effort uh, by the Department of Food and Agriculture, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Office of Planning and Research. Uh, and we had convened a group of scientists to talk about biodiversity uh, challenges and, and sort of a call to action around biodiversity in California. Uh, Governor Brown issued Executive Order B-5418 uh, in September, early September, uh, accompanied by this roadmap for protecting the state's native biodiversity. Um, it's a very short roadmap with a few um, key action items in the near term, uh, but really looking across our state programs, how we can integrate consideration of native plants um, and, um, and animals into the work that we do. And so I've, I mentioned this, it touches on a lot of work and it was a tremendous amount of work coming out of the Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, but it is something we are also thinking about how our conservation work can help to inform implementation of the Biodiversity Initiative. And with that, I will turn it over to Natalie. Thanks, Louise. All right, so for the legislative report, obviously a lot has happened in the legislature since the last update. Um, this session has concluded and the governor is now determining whether to sign or veto bills. Um, he has until the uh, midnight on Sunday, so there is one bill where we cannot provide you with the outcome yet, but we can give you a quick update. Um, these are the three bills that made it to the governor's desk. Uh, in earlier reports, we talked about the bill that would codify the HIAP program. Um, unfortunately, that was held in Senate appropriations, so that did not make it to the governor's desk. The first bill is SB 1072, which establishes regional climate collaboratives, and that was signed by the governor. So SGC is now determining how it will implement the bill. There are two requirements. The first is to create a capacity building grant program, um, and SGC must develop guidelines for that program by October 1st, 2019. The second requirement is for SGC to draft guidelines on technical assistance, um, namely best practices in technical assistance to aid other state agencies that are looking to improve their technical assistance programs or create new technical assistance programs. And those guidelines um, must be complete by July 1st, 2020. Uh, second is AB 2258. This would have created a LAFCO grant program, um, and it was vetoed by the governor, um, who reasoned that the grant program should be considered as part of the budget process um, and not through the legislative process. And finally is AB 1945. Um, this bill creates a number of or would create a number of changes um, to the CCI programs. It's currently on the governor's desk. Um, so we can provide an update at the next meeting about the outcome. Among other things, if the bill was signed, it would require AHSC and TCC to create new categories based on urban, rural, and suburban areas um, with distinct scoring criteria for each of those. Hi, quick question. Thanks for yeah. the update. Uh, just because I'm not aware, for SB 1072 then, so was there funds allocated for a grant or? The yeah, there have not been funds allocated for the grant program yet, um, so we're still determining um, what that would look like. They could be awarded in the next budget, um, but per the statutory requirements, SGC has to have the grant guidelines in place by October. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Uh, I think Louise, you did a nice job uh, summarizing the uh, summit. Um, you know, I think what was impressive to me was not only the summit itself, but but the discussion at the affiliate events. I mean, there were over 300 uh, affiliated events uh, covering a whole range of uh, subjects, uh, uh, from uh, 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 you know carbon pricing mechanisms to environmental justice to uh, natural and working lands and all of them very very well attended um, and uh, good presentation so I, I think it, it, it's appropriate to focus on the summit but I think it's also appropriate to, to focus on much of the discussion that went on around the summit and so that was very encouraging to see um, I'll also just note in a 
personal note, you mentioned the climate safe uh, infrastructure. I remember leaving the first Brown administration in 1982. One of the things we rushed out was a report called Pain the Piper, which was about how to pay for infrastructure in California. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, so I, it's nice to see that these issues don't go away, uh, that we're always looking for these things. So, uh, yeah, Karen. Um, one comment I wanted to make for consideration, um, given the biodiversity initiative, I think that's a very important piece as we've taken a more integrated approach to so many of our programs to really think about how we might be able to use that or overlay it with lands that are being proposed under our SALK program. We've been very bold about proclaiming we should go for as many multi-benefits as possible, and this could be a very important data point for us that could be used in the evaluation of those grants. So um, I'd love to see, even though the executive order came, came kind of late in, in our term of office here, um, to see that kind of work really be incorporated throughout as many existing programs as we have. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, now we're building up to the, the, the real meat of the uh, meeting. So uh, we'll go to uh, item eight, which is the climate change research program. Great. Uh, and again, it's, it's been a while, but it's good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I will, I'll start with this, and then I'm going to hand it over um, to, to Doug Burt uh, to talk through uh, where, we're, where we're headed. Um, and, but I'll pick up uh, on the work uh, having helped SGC uh, in my previous role on the development of the research investment plan, talk through that. Um, there are two elements here uh, that we're bringing to the council, and, I, and we'll walk through them one by one. The first is uh, to approve and adopt amendments to the Climate Change Research Program Research Investment Plan. Um, and approve its use to guide future research investments. And that's the part I'll walk through. Uh, and then uh, Doug will walk through the framework for round two of the Climate Change Research Program. Um, and this is a similar, uh, just to, to refresh, this is again, much like round one, a program that has been moving very quickly. Uh, in round one, we had developed the investment plan and we brought it to the council in January of uh, 2018. It was approved and then from there, we, we put out the request for proposals for round one. Uh, I would like to very happily report, uh, we made those awards and we actually have contracts in place already with several of our awardees in round one uh, and work is getting underway. Um, really, uh, thanks to Liz Grassi, Kevin, and Blake Deering on our staff who've just done an incredible job working with those awardees. We did actually, I should say, just to highlight, uh, we got a note from one of the UCs that it was the smoothest contracting process they had ever experienced. So I think that reflects nicely on our, our staff and uh, really great to get those contracts in place so quickly. So round one is um, underway. Uh, and, and we're finalizing all of those agreements. So just to refresh, um, the Climate Change Research Program is a competitive grant program that was funded through the Clim California Climate Investments Program. Uh, the, in, the initial legislation was that it support research on reducing carbon emissions that emphasizes California and may include clean energy and adaptation and resiliency. In the first round, we had about $10.5 million available for award, um, and that's what we're getting out uh, right now. In the second round, we have uh, just about, just over $17 million available um, for funding. Uh, and in the governor's budget for this second round in his proposed budget, uh, the, the emphasis that was, um, was placed was on technology development and demonstration. And so I'll walk through that, which I believe we had discussed early on in, uh, in January back with our investment plan. So uh, what we've been looking at is we did, um, in developing the first investment plan, we did significant outreach to the research community as well as with stakeholders. So we held um, four research roundtables and several public workshops to develop that investment plan. 
And so we really want to build on that work. And so we wanted to take that, that the core of that plan and make it applicable across more than just one round of funding. So what we're proposing to do is to maintain the core elements of the research program, or sorry, the research um, investment plan, where we received a lot of input on the program goals and the research priority areas. Uh, we've also um, amended it to add a new grant type, which I'll talk through for round two. Um, and made some other adjustments. We also really wanted to take out specific language to round one that would make it be able to work across multiple years of funding. So I'll walk through the specific changes that we made. So um, I just want to, I do want to start though with the core elements of the research program, because I think this is really the heart of what we've been trying to do um, through, through this program. And that is we developed a set of seven program goals that all have to be addressed as a threshold requirement for all awardees. And we are proposing that this remain constant and consistent across all rounds of funding. And we defined five research priority areas. And again, we want to maintain those um, in this, in the investment plan. So just to remind folks of what those, the program goals. So this is what we want um, the research that we invest in to work towards. So the first is that we have a clear connection to the state's climate goals, both reducing emissions and preparing for impacts. Uh, we want to advance research that has benefits to low income and disadvantaged communities and that advance equitable outcomes in our climate change uh, policies and investments. Uh, we're looking to build on programs, not duplicate, of course, and also to really use our cross-agency nature to fill gaps between programs in some of these overlapping areas. We want to prioritize outcome-based research that's linked to practical climate action. We want to model meaningful engagement um, with the research community, the community-based organizations, and other stakeholders in all stages of the process, of the research process. So from project conceptualization, conducting the work, to presenting the results. Uh, and I would just uh, mention, you know, we did for round one, um, and we'll continue in round two to score all proposals, um, both for the research merits and on engagement. So we really want to make that uh, be something that is concrete. Uh, another one of our goals was to continue to advance and develop a common research platform that can incur it, that can um, support climate change planning so that we, we're, all, we're not developing some new piece of, some new tool that doesn't work with other tools or um, you know, using a whole different set of data that isn't consistent with, uh, with the work the state has been doing. And then finally, we wanted to leverage and complement existing research funding and policy innovations. So that's both state funding, but also federal um, investments that are being made. So those are the goals of the program, and we have asked applicants in round one, and we'll continue in round two, to ask all applicants to discuss how their research touches on these program goals. The research investment plan also then laid out the uh, five research priority areas. In round one, we focused on research area, priority areas one to four. Um, and for round five, with the direction from uh, the governor's budget proposal, we're proposing a focus on research area five, which is low greenhouse gas um, transformative technology development and deployment. And so this is really thinking about demonstration projects, opportunities to be doing work that with scale up can lead to rapid greenhouse gas emission reductions, other um, positive climate outcomes, um, uh, for, from, from the investment. So that core of the research plan is, is remaining intact and we want to continue to invest in those areas and adhere to those goals that the council approved in January. Um, well, one amendment we did make to account for investment in um, in this fifth priority area, if you'll recall in round one, we awarded project grants. So these were smaller, less than a million dollars, pretty focused um, projects. We awarded seven of those. And then we awarded seven, or sorry, three research partnership grants, which were intended to be more collaborative efforts focused on a broader research area. Um, and so, uh, but for the technology demonstration piece, we have added a, a third grant type, which is an innovation center research grant. And this is really um, 
similar in a way to the partnership grant, but with a focus on research and development. Um, and it's really to really call out that what we're trying to do is focus on transformative, scalable, clean technologies um, that would be consistent with areas specified in a solicitation and that would be seen with wide application to be necessary to reach our climate goals. So um, in, the, in the binder, we have the shortened, the amended research investment plan and this description, which goes into a bit more detail, um, and apologies for the form, font formatting issue in that, um, that is on page six of that plan. Um, another amendment that we um, are proposing to make uh, with this round of funding based on the outreach we've done is to expand institutional eligibility. Um, so the, in the originating uh, legislation for this called out um, the University of California, California State University, federally funded national laboratories and private nonprofit colleges and universities. We are proposing that we also add research in nonprofit research institutions located in California. Uh, and this is to capture the clean tech, the incubator type of collaboratives that exist um, and, and to bring in some of that connection to, to, to the market. So how do you think about taking, doing the research and getting out into the world? So working with potentially community-based organizations or other institutions to do that. And this would be, this is on page seven of the investment plan where we've added um, the research institutions. And so again, just trying to broaden that scope so that we can get to the, the deployment piece. Um, and then finally, a few other points I just wanted to note um, in, in, what, in the amendments to the plan. Um, in the original plan, we had laid out a program timeline that corresponded with round one of the funding. And so instead, we just point to linking that timeline to the appropriation legislation. Um, the review process, uh, we are proposing to maintain a, the same review process that is laid out uh, that we c completed in round one which was um, to do an expert advisory panel, so external, made up of both external and state agency experts, um, but then, and then also an interagency review process. Uh, we're maintaining the same indirect cost rate, so maxima, a maximum of 25%. Um, and then instead of having the application instructions contained in the investment plan, those will be given in the solicitation. So, you know, um, the, the specifics in terms of the, the elements and pieces of your application. Um, so really it intends to streamline the investment plan. We've also included uh, language to indicate we would update the investment plan at least every three years. Um, but the intention is really again to make it so we can use it um, and not have to try to update that, uh, that plan uh, every time there's an appropriation made. Um, but that we would revisit it in consultation with our state agency partners and with other stakeholders at, at least every three years. Um, and so those are the proposed updates to the research investment plan um, and that we would like to be able to take to inform the solicitation for the second round of research funding. I'm happy to stop there, answer questions, and then we can move on or we could go through everything, uh, whichever the council would prefer. There, there seems to be a question coming. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. uh, are there any questions from the members of the uh, council? Uh, let me ask this. We are, we're not bound by statute to the eligible applicants. Are we, we're authorized uh, to uh, expand the eligible applicants to include research institutions located in California as well? Yes, we just at a minimum have to include those first four of UC, CSU, federally funded national labs, and private colleges and universities. Okay, okay. and then um, you'll be, well, we'll get in the next phase in a second, so I'll, I'll hold off on my uh, uh, other questions until after, you're, because you're gonna talk about the round two applications. Yes, yeah, so actually okay. I'm gonna turn it over um, to Doug Burt to talk through the work he's been doing and sort of to, and I, and I will say um, for round uh, one, we, um, we had four priority research areas. 
we're now focusing in this technology development area, but wanted to do some work to further, to, to figure out what are the opportunities and what are what look like high um, areas of investment with um, that either there's gaps in funding or where there seems to be a high likelihood of success with investment. And so that's what Doug will talk about is how we've tried to give a little bit more structure to that very broad area of technology development. Do you have a question? I just thought of a question. Yes. Um, and thank you for the update thus far. <laughs> uh, so will there be a continuous, you know, continuous rounds moving forward? <laughs> This I, is this is an annual appropriation, um, oh, okay. so right. we're we're hopeful. Well, no. I think uh, we've been trying to build a model of doing this really outcome-oriented, engaged research, and uh, and so we're very hopeful that we can continue doing it. Uh, just an idea, because I know that one of the winners of the first round was a SDSU. Yeah. Yes, and I made a note to myself to meet with them to learn more about what they're doing. Um, but I'm pretty clear, you know, being in the environmental community, like they're not even aware of SDSU having that grant. So that connection with the community isn't there. Okay. Um, but we can build it. Yes. So it's, you know, it's not, it's, we can certainly build bridges as appropriate and helpful. Um, but I think it'd be really uh, critically important for the community to understand and benefit from other, whatever research is being um, done in San Diego. I assume it's benefiting the whole state, but. Yes. You know, there's a particular connection with the community. So it just made me think as you were talking about um, what the purpose is that, hey, we should really, the community should be really aware and I'm sure they would want to know the outcomes. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really good point and something we have been talking a lot about as well is how do we get out the information about the projects and continue to work with research on researchers. We got this feedback actually a lot from the research oh, okay. community in in round one, we did the outreach where this is not their area of expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a lot of concern about how the time it would take, the skill set. Um, that said, all of the applicants um, were had really nice engagement, but I think it's an area we want to continue to help with because it's somewhere where we can help to build those bridges. Um, so it's certainly an ongoing area of work. And I'll certainly help to be a bridge since that's where kind of my people are. Yeah, you know, great, <laughs> thank community. you. And so I, and I'm with a lot of community-based organizations so I can facilitate, at least in San Diego, great. that kind of connection. Thank you. And, and actually, in some ways, you may be in a better position than any of the rest of the members of the council to make sure that there are continuing appropriations. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, just, just a notation. No pressure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and you're right. You, 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 uh, hit on one of the issues that, that, that came up when we were discussing this whole research program, which is to make sure that it is meaningful and it is practical and it really has effects on the, this research is going to lead to effects on the ground. Mm -hmm. So there is that interest in promoting that community outreach so that we can make sure this research is meaningful. Great. And so that's where we'll go into the next round of meaningful research. So, Great. Uh, <laughs> Good afternoon, council members. Yeah, so I'll just give you a broad overview of how we're gonna, how we are proposing to build round two. Um, it's been an interesting process. It's been a bit different and um, certainly a little bit more accelerated than round one, um, but we're hoping to build a, a really meaningful and, and uh, practical uh, proposal as described. So again, just to give a, a broad overview, um, we're hoping to focus on uh, priority area number five of the research investment plan, this clean technology development and deployment. We were allocated 18 million from the GGRF budget, uh, the 2018-2019 budget, of which 17.1 will be available for a competitive grant program. So we're, we've built this proposal based on the governor's proposed budget back in January. And in that, he included something called the Climate Change Technology and Solutions Initiative. And the idea was to use this research program to advance the development and deployment of transformative clean technologies that were seen as necessary for um, achieving, excuse me, achieving the state's uh, 2030 and 2050 climate goals, as well as to support the ongoing efforts to build advanced research partnerships and initiatives. And from that proposal, we've uh, kind of pulled out four specific objectives in addition to the program goals outlined in the research investment program. So the first is that investments in these in, uh, innovative technologies 
should be able to both demonstrate um, you know, significant reductions in GHG emissions, um, as well as the ability to be replicated and scaled outside of California. The second of these was that um, these projects or portfolio projects um, should be able to provide a holistic approach in terms of problem solving in one or more of the research areas. And I'll talk about the research areas in a little bit. The third main objective was, again, to focus on building strong and meaningful partnerships with non-traditional members of um, the research community. So trying to encourage researchers to work um, with community-based organizations, NGOs, private sector, et cetera, to really build um, outcome-driven and climate action um, research. And then lastly, um, all of the innovations that we invest in should have direct and indirect benefits to the state's most disadvantaged communities. So um, after we made awards in July, um, staff began to uh, figure out a way to build out uh, the second round of, um, of this program. And unfortunately, because of the uh, timing, we didn't necessarily have enough time to do a formal uh, request for information process. So instead, we began this informal outreach process. Um, staff held over 40 different focus meetings with stakeholders, um, including representatives from state agencies, uh, different research institutions, startups, uh, CBOs, NGOs, um, and various other entities. And the purpose of this was um, to identify ways that we can maximize the impacts of our funds. So California has a very large research and development portfolio. And the idea was, through this outreach, we could identify areas of opportunity that may not enjoy the same level of investment as um, other areas, and that um, with these funds could really have um, major gains in terms of research and development. And so we identified three different research areas from this outreach, uh, the first of which was carbon dioxide removal. Um, as the fourth California climate change assessment and various other climate models um, demonstrate, there is a, uh, a major need for a rapid reduction in greenhouse gases that are currently in our atmosphere. Um, so it's often called carbon dioxide removal or CDR. And basically it's different processes to permanently remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and so we're interested in kind of two different um, approaches here. The first being engineered solutions, such as direct air capture, and then natural system solutions, such as afforestation or biochar in terms of uh, forest and soil management. Um, and outreach identified this area as um, a bit earlier stage in terms of R the R&D process than the other two research areas. And so staff anticipates that applications will, uh, will reflect this. The second research area was uh, methane reduction. Um, as we know, methane is uh, a highly potent greenhouse gas, uh, much more so than uh, carbon dioxide. And um, the fourth climate change assessment um, also um, uh, uh, outlines that we need significant reductions in methane uh, emissions in order for the state to meet its 2030 and 2050 climate goals. Uh, right now, it's about 9% of our state's uh, GHG inventory. Um, and of those, uh, the three biggest sources of methane emissions currently are in the state are agriculture, industry, and landfills. And so uh, staff is hoping to invest in one or more of uh, those areas to um, help develop technologies for methane reduction. And then lastly, um, the third research area is heating, cooling, and thermal storage systems. Um, this was the most common recommendation made during our outreach process. Um, as the state continues to experience more extreme weather events, uh, there's going to be a much greater need for um, more sustainable and cleaner HVAC systems. Um, otherwise, we're going to see um, a much greater stress uh, on the electrical grid, as well as greater um, pollutants of uh, refrigerants, such as HFCs. Um, staff in particular thinks that this, uh, um, this research area really is at the core of the SGC's mission in terms of um, sustainable communities uh, because of the way that it promotes climate adaptation, helping communities to cope with these weather events, as well as climate mitigation um, to uh, you know, make cleaner systems that don't rely so much on um, highly pollutant uh, HFCs. Uh, also, uh, there is a clear connection to disadvantaged communities as they are often in the most vulnerable areas um, to uh, the impacts of climate change. So just as a broad overview of uh, what we're proposing for a program structure for round two, um, we recommend uh, that the SEC make roughly three to four grants of three to five million 
Outreach identified the need for a, a larger grant size because technology development is simply is expensive, it's challenging, and um, it would need a, a greater amount of funds in order to see success. Um, the eligible applicants, as uh, Louise mentioned earlier, uh, are going to remain the same except for the addition of private nonprofit research institutions. However, we uh, will certainly allow for public-private partnerships as we recognize the private sector's role in technology development. Additionally, uh, we will maintain the same two-step review process from round one. So the first step will be an external advisory committee made up of experts from a variety of different backgrounds, so scientists as well as um, those with experience in technology commercialization. Um, and then the second step being an interagency committee made up of representatives from different California state agencies who can bring a more policy background um, to the proposal process. In terms of uh, next steps and, and uh, a rough timeline, um, following this council meeting, uh, SGC staff is hoping to release a request for proposals uh, in early October. The applications we do in early November, which will then kick off the uh, proposal review period. Um, we hope to have an external advisory committee meeting in late November, followed by shortly by an interagency committee in early December. Um, award recommendations will be posted on December 10th, and then uh, awards will be approved of by the council uh, in, on December 20th. So again, as a reminder, um, SGC staff recommends approving and adopting the amendments to the research investment plan as well as approving the uh, framework for the second round of the research program. Um, thanks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, are there any uh, questions from the council at this time? Please. Um, this pertains to the first item in approving the investment plan to guide future research investments. And I think, Louise, I heard you say that the time frame was three years, and is that reflected in the action or as part of the document? Or it's how does included that in the document. We, we included language that said we would revisit it at least every three years. Um, I should also mention we've been um, talking with the research working group of the, Cal the climate action team and would also love to tie this to an update to the state's climate change research plan, which was completed in 2015. So we're certainly also exploring with them. They're about to undertake potentially uh, a look at what's been invested in. And so I, I, we want to tie this as much as possible to some of the, those other efforts as well. Um, but just wanted to recognize that it, it's not, uh, in the timelines we have, feasible to do the level of outreach that was done in round one. And I think the information we gathered um, has some longevity for at least a few years, and so that's what we wanted to reflect. Secretary Ross. Um, so I wanna thank you for all the work on this. Um, I also wanna comment, this is a very aggressive timeline, and I appreciate that very much. And I'm just wondering if there have been enough conversations with various parties in the research community to have confidence that they know it's coming, they're watching for it, they're prepared to come forth with great quality proposals. Yeah, so we've, I mean, as I mentioned, we've had conversations with over uh, 40 different individuals. We've been in contact with them. A number of them, we've had follow-up conversations as well. Um, we're hoping to um, reach out to them as soon as the RFP is ready, um, just to keep them in the loop. But um, yes, I think we're confident that uh, members of the research community are um, uh, aware of this opportunity. Great, thanks. And, and I may mention that we have five speakers who are waiting to uh, to uh, talk to us, so they may be able to address that issue as well. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, please. I'm just echoing the um, the feedback on how how great this has been to to watch this develop so quickly and um, be you know such a great new program for the state. Um, one thing that I just wanted to to put on your radar is the um, the advisory committee. Um, I think it would be prudent to make sure that there are very clear um, guidelines and roles and responsibilities um, mapped out up front because I think that having scores from advisory committee that then are provided to an inter interagency review committee that then makes the ultimate decision could be a little bit of could be a little bit confusing and just to make sure to set expectations with the advisory committee um, regarding how their scores will be utilized and evaluated would, would probably go a long way towards making sure that this process moves smoothly. Yeah, and that's a great point. I think uh, just I would note in round one, the way uh, we did this, we had uh, basically yes or no decisions from that ex external advisory committee. So we ended up with about 
40, I think it was about $42 million worth of projects passed on that they said, yes, they would fund this. And so there was that, that expectation was very clear, but I think that's a very good point. And it's something um, we will continue to communicate. And I, I think we, um, you know, would like to be able to get to where we have a very clear recommendation coming out of that committee. Um, and the comments of that committee were exceptionally helpful in informing how the interagency committee um, uh, looked over everything. Thank you. Any other questions at this point, comments? Okay, we'll go then to the uh, public comment portion of the meeting. Um, and I will take a chance here and say that I think it's Michael Claiborne, perhaps? Oh, okay. I'm sure that he would have had excellent comments, but we will then go to uh, James Hawley, followed by Kim Danko. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Um, uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Nicole, welcome to the council. Um, you've done great work in San Diego. We're excited that you're here. Um, I just want to say briefly, we reiterate our strong appreciation to the council for your strong support and implementation of this program. I certainly want to call out the work of, uh, of Louise and Doug and Liz on this. Uh, and obviously, we are supportive of the funding increase um, that was uh, appropriated by the legislature. Um, I, I do want to say the lab is supportive of the additional uh, investment area, the support for low GHG transformative technologies. Um, we also want to say, you know, we support the fact that you're maintaining the first four priorities. The, you know, there were on adaptation and resilience, particularly for low income disadvantaged communities. That was very important. I believe there are probably a number of uh, proposals that were not able to be funded in that because of the demand in the last round. So we just want to extend our support for those. I also want to ask that, um, and I, may, I haven't had a chance to look at this, but uh, maintaining the terms and conditions for national labs to facilitate easy contracting with the labs would also be very, very much appreciated. So, but again, thank you for the support of this program. We're really excited and look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. So Kim Denko followed by Veronica Beattie. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak regarding the Climate Change Research Program. Uh, my name is Kim Danko, and I'm here on behalf of the Institute for Local Government. ILG and our partners at the League of California Cities and the California State Association of Counties believe that focused applied research aimed at understanding and addressing the issues and needs of local governments is important to the overall success of local climate action measures. In our earlier comments on the research plan, ILG, the League, and CSAC agreed on three principles that we hope will guide your investments in climate research. First, limited research resources should focus on informing action. In our view, this will require an understanding of local programs and practices and close familiarity and working relationships with the leaders and practitioners who are developing and implementing climate actions at the local level. ILG, the League, and CSAC can help foster relationships with local leaders who can take action based on research findings. Second, research should accelerate the spread of local best practices. In our view, spreading good ideas that have been tested and adapted by early adopters is a more urgent priority at this point than focusing limited research funding on untested innovations that may take years to re yield results. We hope you will review research proposals with an eye toward how well the research design makes spreading good ideas a high priority. Third, research priorities should address critical areas of local concern. As you move forward, we hope you will consider how the research focus on carbon dioxide removal, methane reduction, and heating, cooling, and thermal storage systems can be seen by local leaders as relevant to the issues they care about. For example, sequestering carbon through natural systems holds out the promise of reinforcing the health of forests, rangelands, watersheds, and open space. This in turn can address key local concerns like wildfire risk, water supply, and local jobs and economic development. The same connections to important community benefits can be drawn for methane reduction and building heating and cooling, but only if the research is presented to local community leaders in ways that they can relate to and understand. As you may know, ILG is already assisting researchers from round one to translate their findings 
for action by local leaders, and we would welcome the opportunity to assist in round two as well. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Well, thank you. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Veronica uh, Beatty or Beatty, and followed by Alicia Sebastian. Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Beatty, and I'm the Policy Director for the Sacramento Housing Alliance. The Sacramento Housing Alliance is a member-based organization who represents developers of affordable housing, service providers, and individuals committed to housing justice in healthy communities. We advocate for safe, stable, accessible, and affordable homes in the Sacramento region. I am taking this opportunity today to comment on the draft guidelines for round four of the AHSC program and provide a perspective from the Sacramento region to inform the program. We want to thank you for the changes made to the infill definition that will allow the kinds of irregular parcels more common in rural developments to be competitive, and for your commitment to quality community engagement that will be facilitated by the tracking sheet for assessing community needs. We continue to have concerns about the need for equity between project area types. For the Sacramento region to be competitive in the program and do our part in achieving the greenhouse gas reductions throughout the state, we believe that project area types need to be designed to meet the needs of smaller, less urban communities. Sacramento and our surrounding area, like the rest of non-rural California, find ourselves competing in the ICP and TOD categories up against larger cities who are more dense, better resourced, staffed, and funded. With the ICP program in particular, this leaves Sacramento region projects losing out in scoring categories that are more reflective of jurisdictional capacity, despite demonstrable GHG reductions on par with other projects. We strongly urge the council and staff to break down the ICP category to facilitate smaller cities engagement in helping California meet its climate goals. Finally, we encourage you to strengthen your outreach to local elected officials and transportation agencies on the importance of the program and the opportunities it provides to link affordable housing and transportation developments for the benefit of all. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, I will note for the record that I think some of that commentary went actually to uh, another item that's on the agenda, item eight. But um, your comments will be noted nonetheless, so we appreciate the comments. And uh, I'll note that that item will likely come back also for additional hearing in uh, October. Is that correct, Louise? For item... That was, eight, that was the item uh, 884, uh, the uh, Prop 84 funding? Well, I think that was really around um, the round four guidelines, so okay. those will come back as a new item. Okay. So that might have fallen more in the uh, general public comment. Okay, okay. Um, but thank you for the but comments. we will note them, um, yes. And then Alicia Sebastian on... Uh... Okay. Okay, then excellent. Okay. Um, so are there any other questions? for the staff or comments at this point. So it seems we have two actions before us. One is an amendment to the, um, uh, to the plan itself, the investment plan itself. And then you would like direction from us to go out and do an RFP covering the, basically the uh, focus areas that you discuss on page four of the staff report, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, um, so do, is there a, a discussion from the council or do we have a motion? So I'm going to make a point. I, I think this is a good approach the uh, staff have put together. I do want to mention uh, there's a lot of university research going on uh, through different state agencies at uh, uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, with some of the new money from uh, Senate Bill 1 of 2017, we're uh, funding new research. Uh, through that uh, Caltrans research funding, we also are a, a funding partner at the UC Davis that has a national transportation center. It's also funded by the federal government, but the focus at UC Davis is on sustainable transportation. And uh, again, there's uh, I think the council's involvement in research is an opportunity as well to further coordinate and share the research projects that are ongoing, especially in the sustainability area. So I, I, I applaud the uh, a group that's gotten together at the SGC to look at these research issues and hope that that group will continue to uh, share the research going on in our individual departments as well so that information's better disseminated within 
a state government, but perhaps also in a, in a council format, uh, perhaps at, at future meeting, I have a bit of a uh, sustainable research uh, overview where we might uh, look at what we're doing across the state, not just with the specific SGC program. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? So do I hear a motion to amend the uh, investment plan as proposed by staff? So moved. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Second, okay, right. Uh, any further discussion? We'll take these items separately. So, uh, okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Uh, it's unanimously approved. The next item then that we need to talk about is a direction to the uh, staff um, uh, to uh, release a request for proposals. And as I said, they would be focusing on the, the items that you identified in the uh, staff report. Is that correct, Louise? Yes, that's okay. right. Okay. And I would just add, I guess, to Brian's point, uh, we will continue to work. We have a steering committee of state agencies that we're working with. Um, we have a meeting scheduled actually for tomorrow um, to reconvene with that group uh, in the RFP development. So to make sure those connections are made. Okay. Um, then. Um, uh, well, you know, I think I think it'd be good to get the will of the council on this to make sure. I, you know, to be candid, if we weren't looking at such a tight timeline, I might want a little bit more specificity on what was going to go in the RFP, and uh, and might even want to have it brought back to us. But I think at this point, uh, we've got a good sense of direction, and and uh, we've had a good uh, presentation from you. So I think. That's sufficient, but I do want to make sure that the that we've got the will of the entire council, and uh, I don't want to usurp Ken's role anyway as the uh, chair. So, uh, yes. So again, my question <clears throat> really speaks to the fact that I'm new and learning. So, I'm likely to support. I just had a, again sometimes these questions just emerge as I'm hearing them, even though I've heard this is the second time. <laughs> since I will say Louise did come down to San Diego and give me a briefing last week. So, mm -hmm. but you know sometimes it takes time to process. Yeah. So I guess I, it just hit me, um, so this is a basic question, but why is this agency doing kind of energy research when there's money at PUC and CEC for that? I think that's actually an excellent question. I think, um, uh, is it, is that better? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, we have been working closely, uh, so the CEC has an extensive energy research program, and so that has been an area that we have tried to, uh, that we've been working with them to avoid overlap uh, with that. Um, and so as to why SGC is uh, doing the research, uh, you know, I think we've taken it as our role um, as a cross-agency body to be able to do some more integrative research to bring in the community engagement piece. Um, and then particularly, uh, especially in round one where we did I, what I would call more traditional research projects, they really did fit in some of these interstitial spaces that tend to fall out. So uh, in straight agent, uh, agency or department programs, and that's where, and we did that on purpose uh, through conversation with the Air Resources Board, the Energy Commission, and others where you know they have a direction and they said, but we would really like to understand you know something else more and we have but we haven't been able to fund it so uh, we've really taken our role in doing this work to try to find some of that integrated um, some of these issues that fall um, either cut across multiple agencies or you know just don't fit neatly into a given area um, and so uh, so I think on this case uh, on the technology side that is also why uh, we have the heating and cooling, and that is a topic we've discussed with the Energy Commission, but you don't see a lot of other energy work because a lot of that is happening. Likewise, on the transportation side, the work that is happening through investments um, uh, with through the UC transportation centers and others uh, is, is not an area where we focused as well because of that, avoiding that overlap. And so we tried to find some of these areas that uh, where there either wasn't a significant um, 
funding program or that just didn't fit neatly in other areas? Okay, and so uh, since I was already uh, advised, I think wisely that I'm hopefully gonna help get continued appropriation, not, con or, sorry, what's the right <laughs> word, annual appropriations? I know these are like, uh, I don't know the terminology yet, but um, so happy to be of service in that regard. I will just say, you know, reviewing the um, research grants that were awarded in phase one were really exciting to me as someone in the community who's trying to advocate at local governments. Uh, so I'll just stay say, since this is, you know, what I do for a living is that in a lot of the climate plans that are being developed, uh, obviously the state is, covering a lot of the greenhouse gas reductions that are needed for them to hit the targets. Um, but there's always that gap, a huge gap, uh, that the local governments need to step up and uh, kind of you know make sure that they're reaching the state goals. And to have data or to have university research that backs up the policy proposal could be really helpful in getting it across the finish line. And we're even struggling in the city of San Diego to get the council and the mayor comfortable with taking you know, to passing some bold policies because they're not sure, like, well, where's the evidence? Where's the data? So I'm just saying, so mm -hmm. my heart is in the in the phase one. Um, but, I, you know, I'm again, I know I'm new and I'm here to support right now, but it just, you know, what I hope in the future we continue to think about is how do we enable local governments to feel empowered um, to move forward? I think that that's an excellent point. And I think uh, it actually speaks to one of the comments from the public comment period um, from uh, yeah. Kim Danko from ILG, and I, I think... What is ILG, sorry. Oh, sorry, the Institute for Local Government. Okay, I'm learning, okay. Um, uh, Kim, you should reach out to me. <laughs> because I think that partnership piece and the engagement piece around the research is really important, and that is something, like I said, in round one, we scored and we will score again in round two, so that structurally will stay the same, and I think it gets exactly to that point of we're not... Um, investing in something in a vacuum, but also thinking about what would uh, scaling something up look like, whether that's with local governments or if in the methane reduction it's with farmers or you know, foresters for carbon dioxide removal, you know, that, that engagement piece is happening. And so I think that's a really critical piece and something in our program we're committed to not just sort of having a checkbox, but we also had someone look at every proposal with an engagement lens to say, you know, is this, is there something really there? And um, in, you know, in some cases there was, in some cases there wasn't, but we also committed to uh, funding the proposals that had that, met that engagement criteria and received a positive engagement review. Great, and that are connected to policies that are actually being considered by mm -hmm. local governments. I mean, I, I assume it's easier to connect to state policy right. discussions here because you're kind of here, you know, here in the same town. But down <laughs> in San Diego, like we miss a lot what's yeah. happening in the state, and so uh, we struggle as grassroots advocates to kind of, again, communicate with our elected officials about how the data is there, the technology is available, or it's on the cusp of being available, and you know, thus we should feel confident moving forward. But I think you get it, and I'm thank yes. you know, thanks for your response, yeah. and looking forward to working with you on this. Yeah, and, and, and part of it is we're given the money, so okay. But if you look at the priorities we've set out, they do feed into some of the other programs that we've got. So as we're looking at agricultural lands and uh, the, the idea would be that this research would inform our future decisions and future grants for uh, uh, agricultural purposes or, you know, uh, for helping communities um, uh, in the future. So, um, and so, yeah, that the, the research will help us and inform our future grant rounds, I think. So, uh, having said that, um, so are we in favor of uh, giving direction to the staff, which is that they should go out do this uh, uh, referral for proposal or request for proposals, uh, work up uh, um, uh, standards or, or uh, uh, yeah, standards for the uh, reviewing the proposals, yeah, consistent with what uh, the, you've identified as the focus areas on page four of the uh, staff report. Is that yes? That sufficiently clear direction yeah. to you? and we'll follow a similar approach to round one. Uh, so I just want to reiterate that in terms of the engagement pieces and. So I think other than the focus areas, our approach will remain consistent with the direction we received in January. Okay. So, uh, let's, let's, so I, well, let's do this. I will make the motion to give that uh, direction to the uh, staff to uh, do the request for proposals as described. Do I have a second? Second. Oh, okay. Nicole.
Nicole. Okay, Nicole. Nicole. Welcome to the uh, council. <laughs> uh, I'll say, all those in favor, uh, say uh, aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, you have your direction, so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. No. no, no, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Did, but your light is on. Did you have something you wanted oh, to say? No. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, so I believe that takes us to then the public comment period. Are we, we've done, or, and l let it be noted that if Ken's not in charge of this meeting, we get done an hour and a half <laughs> early. Um, so this is the public comment period, which I have already rushed through and had the public comment. Are there any other public comments that we've heard from? Yes. Aha. Oh. Uh -huh. Do you want to come up and speak? Okay. So this is now the time to hear from Alicia Sebastian. Okay. Thank you so much. Alicia Sebastian. You have an hour and a half. We've got time. <laughs> well, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're all in the same room finally. No, um, we will keep it appropriately brief, I assure you. Um, I am with the California Coalition for Rural Housing. Uh, CCRH is also a member of the Rural Smart Growth Task Force. You should have all received many letters from us over the, <laughs> recently and, and before. Uh, CCRH members serve rural, farm worker, and American Indian tribal communities across the state. And over half of our members also develop in more urban areas as well. Um, and as ever, we are grateful for our partnership with the SGC and HCD as TA providers, and also for the ongoing opportunity to work closely to shape and grow the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities program and its impact. We are here today to comment specifically about the recently released round four draft guidelines, which we know will be you'll be voting on and approving later. So we're hoping to have some comments now to give you some food for thought while you're looking over that and taking that into consideration. Uh, we really appreciate SGC and HCD's efforts to streamline the application process and to provide increased clarity, consistency, and transparency. Um, the proposed round four guidelines also feature welcome adjustments to the definition of infill. We believe that AHSC program and technical assistance efforts continue to be incredibly successful in catalyzing communities and changing the way that communities really think and plan. And we really hope to see this success in all communities. However, because the ICP or interconnectivity project area encompasses all applications outside of the appropriately specific TOD and RIPA categories, all of the other smaller cities and any basically non-rural area of the state have to compete directly with much larger counterparts, including many of those counterparts that also feature TOD areas. So this is especially problematic when considering the varying capacities and resources necessary for success within the AHSC program. So larger, more urban jurisdictions have more staffing, resources often have more local funding with which to assemble one of these very complicated Com, um, applications. And often our smaller communities lack these resources and lack these capacities and find themselves at a disadvantage when competing. So the AHSC award data also demonstrates that the same level of GHG reductions are occurring across ICP projects. So we're not at a risk of losing GHG reduction, which we know is the ultimate goal of this program. The differentiation between these projects that have been awarded and those that were not actually are falling in the other areas of scoring. So these are the areas that are more dependent on those local resources and the capacity of that community that's applying. So we strongly urge the council and staff to break down the ICP category to facilitate smaller cities engagement in helping California reach its climate investment goals. Thank you. Not an hour and a half. Did you, did, you, <laughs> hey, ben. Did, did you have a question? Oh, I just have a question if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah. Sure. Hi. Um, Hello. So is this related to, again, yep. so sorry, I'm behind the curve on a no, lot of this. No, we do apologize. Related We're to happy legislation that we saw that so, hasn't been signed yet? No, this is actually oh. related to the guidelines that determine uh, how applicants can apply and receive the awards for the affordable housing and sustainable community projects. And so uh, those are broken down into the kinds of projects you can apply under. And one of the categories we have found is inundated or, or full of basically almost all of the communities across the state other than those very rural communities or these really robust transit-based communities. And even some of those really robust communities are still applying within that ICP category. Okay. And that's changed over the round. So we saw that it was different in round one and definitely rounds three, we saw a bigger impact there. Okay. But I, I, am I, I swear I saw that there's still legislation on the governor's desk. It was about something about having new subcategories. 
Of course, I don't remember whose legislation There is was. a bill, uh, 1945, yeah. um, that would create a whole different categories, categorization structure than we currently have. So that's, it's pending. Um, but it's not connected? It's the ideas? If it were to pass, it would affect our programs. Oh, okay. okay, just curious. Or be signed, sorry, it's passed You're, if it were signed. And I just want to clarify, we are not a part of that conversation. We are okay. not talking about the legislation we are talking within the guideline process. Okay, okay, sorry. No, it's more just for my knowledge. No, not, absolutely. I just not to make sure I'm... Whatever's protocol of that, discussing that, but... Um, okay, thank you. Just very informative. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, unless there have been any new cards, I think we're in a position to adjourn. Let's do it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.